Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We are less than three weeks from Election Day and already more than 14 million people have voted. That is over 10 percent of the total vote count from 2016, three weeks out. Unsurprisingly, the president is desperate. And for all the worries about him pulling some authoritarian move and refusing to step down, the much more likely risk is a perfect storm not dissimilar from what we saw in 2016, where polls are systematically off in a certain direction. And then that combined with the electoral college system that already favors Trump and his coalition by a few points, together that puts Trump close enough in battleground states where he can challenge the result in the courts and rerun the Bush v. Gore playbook on its 20th anniversary. And this is not some uh, cable news anchor, you know, wild fanfic hypothesis. Donald Trump has been explicit about that. I think it's very important. I think this will end up in the Supreme Court. And I think it's very important that we have nine justices. I think it's better if you go before the election, because I think this this scam that the Democrats are pulling, it's a scam. This scam will be before the United States Supreme Court. And I think having a 4-4 situation is not a good situation. I think it will go before the Supreme Court. That's what he says about the election. That's the plan. Like Trump said, it is part of the reason they are trying to confirm Amy, Co Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court and confirm her so quickly. He knows Bush v. Gore laid the groundwork for how to steal a presidential election. Whether you remember or not, in the 2000 presidential election, it was unequivocal. There was no question that Al Gore had won more votes nationally. But the outcome in Florida was razor, razor thin and highly disputed based on ballot malfunctions and the notorious hanging chads and some absentee ballots. And there was a brutal court battle about whether or not to complete a recount that, when completed, might have shown Gore pulling ahead. But before that could happen, the conservative majority of the Supreme Court stepped in to actively stop a recount in Florida before it might have shown a Gore lead. And they did it based on a constitutional theory that was completely at odds with their own stated principles. They used the broadest possible reading of the Equal Protection Clause in the United States Constitution, a reading so broad that in the ruling itself, the conservative justices had to go out of their way to say, now we're using this here, but you can't ever use it for precedent. It's good for one ride only because they realized how ridiculous their own reasoning was by their own lights. That's how corrupt that decision was. And that is also how George W. Bush became president 20 years ago. And it is notable that those people who participated in the Bush v. Gore fiasco, those people who were the loyal foot soldiers of the conservative movement, working at the ground level to bring it about, to put a president in office who lost a popular vote for the first time in over 100 years, a guy who probably lost the Electoral College too, those people are still around. It didn't go anywhere. In fact, a few of them are on the Supreme Court. One of those lawyers was John Roberts, who, before Bush made him uh, chief justice, edited legal briefs produced each day by the Bush team of 400 lawyers as the case was moving through the lower courts. And he played a crucial role in editing the final 50-page Supreme Court argument prepared in just 24 hours. Good work, Roberts. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, he was also part of Bush's legal team. Bush made him a judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals. And one of them was a young lawyer who was working for the Martin County Republicans. And they had a crazy situation. They were in a desperate attempt to make sure that hundreds of absentee ballot request forms went out to Republican households, even though local Republicans had actually removed the forms from the office of the supervisor of the elections and added the required voter ID numbers and sent them out. So they took them away from the election supervisor. And guess what? Those lawyers did their job. They got those ballots to count. 673 of those ballots would have otherwise been uncounted in a state that Bush ended up winning by 537 votes. If you're not good at math, that's the margin of victory. And as Senator Amy Klobuchar pointed out today, that young lawyer who helped make sure those ballots got counted was Amy Coney Barrett. Many argue that Bush v. Gore, and back to your earlier work, um, hurt the court's legitimacy. If you are confirmed, the Supreme Court will have not one, not two, but three justices, you, Justice Kavanaugh, and Chief Justice Roberts, who worked on behalf of the Republican Party in matters related to the Bush v. Gore case. Do you think that that's a coincidence? Um. 
Senator Klobuchar, if you're asking me whether I was nominated for this seat because I worked on Bush versus Gore for a very brief period of time as a young associate, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. I, think it's I know. A legal question. You said you wouldn't recuse. That's why I thought it was. That isn't so, what I said. I said I well, wouldn't. Well, you said you, I you said that, that you're right. You said you wouldn't make uh, announce your decision on recusal, and you wouldn't commit to recusing. But again, I think the public has a right to know that now three of these justices have worked on the Republican side on a major, major issue related to a presidential election. Is it a coincidence? I don't think it's a coincidence. I mean, participating in Bush v. Gore, working to get the candidate who did not win the popular vote installed in the White House by the courts was the crowning achievement for an entire generation of young conservative movement lawyers who then grew up to have plum assignments like judges and Supreme Court justices. This is a long-standing tradition that's only intensified. I mean, this current generation of movement conservative activists are working hard to suppress the vote, to undermine the legitimacy of elections and follow the president's marching orders to intimidate people at the polls and make it harder to vote. The Washington Post reports that in a conservative training seminar, J. Christian Adams, a former Justice Department official and the president of the Public Interest Legal Foundation, urged the activists not to worry about the criticism that might come their way. Be not afraid of the accusations that you're a voter suppressor, you're a racist, and so forth, Adams says. He's quoting John Paul, John Paul there. Here's another tape the Post obtained from uh, one of their training sessions. I'm fighting every single day from now to the election. I am more and more optimistic about the president's chances. I think we're going to do really well with younger voters. Uh, the Democrats have done a really foolish thing by shutting down all these campuses. Foolish for them. They're, it's going to remove ballot harvesting opportunities and all their voter fraud that they usually do on college campuses. Um, so they're actually removing like half a million votes off the table. So please keep the campuses closed. Like it's a great thing. So whatever. Keep the campuses closed. We don't want those half million people voting. That fine young man is Charlie Kirk. He's a member of the movement. He's a made man, so to speak. He was the first speaker at the Republican National Convention in August. If I ask one thing here, it is please, 20 years from now, please, I beg you, spare me the long op-eds about how we can trust Charlie Kirk to be a fair-minded member of the Supreme Court. People who spend too much time on the internet and Twitter and other social media have a term they use for people like themselves, which is extremely online. Capital E, capital O, extremely online. I think it's fair to say we have an extremely online president. Now, I recognize he's extremely online because I myself am extremely online, and I'm not proud of it. I spend all day on the Internet, and it's probably doing to my brain what a pack of cigarettes a day would do to your lungs. But at least I'm partly aware of it. One of the big problems for Donald Trump and his campaign is they seem to have somehow forgotten how to communicate with anyone who is not extremely online. I mean, just take the, the president's Twitter usage just yesterday, one day. He retweeted a QAnon account suggesting Joe Biden and Barack Obama had SEAL Team 6 killed, which is pretty clearly not true since SEAL Team 6 is alive. One of its members, a Trump supporter, spent all day angrily swatting away the conspiracy theories. Trump also retweeted a conspiracy theory by another QAnon account claiming that Osama bin Laden had secretly been hiding in Iran and then was brought to Pakistan for, quote, Obama's trophy kill. Also totally insane. That's the president tweeting both of those. And then a president who is down by more than 20 points with seniors, according to some polls, uh, at a time when people are dying by tens of thousands in nursing homes because of a pandemic his administration has failed to stop. He tweeted this utterly offensive photoshopped image. I mean, I guess the idea is that elderly people who live in nursing homes are worthless garbage with nothing to offer. Certainly consistent with the way Trump allowed the virus to ravage through our population this year. The only real audience for this kind of thing, the sorts of people who see that are like, oh, so funny, roasted, are like 14 year old boys who never leave the internet. Human beings who have not yet developed their emotional maturity and are incapable of grappling with mortality and find any frailty in the human form disgusting and contemptible. But those are not the voters that Donald Trump needs, 14-year-old boys who spend all day on the Internet. His campaign seems to believe that because their troll campaign in 2016 was successful, they can troll their way back to re-election. But you actually have to talk to normal people to win an election, and it really looks like they have forgotten how. Now, people who are extremely online call people who are not extremely online normies, normal people. And Joe Biden is running a hell of a normie campaign. Rather than posting weird and offensive images attacking seniors, this is how he talks to them. 
while he throws super spreader parties at the White House, where Republicans hug each other without concern of the consequences. How many of you have been unable to hug your grandkids in the last seven months? I got six of them. Two of them, my deceased son's boys, they live not, children, a boy and a girl, live not far from me. They can walk through the woods. The only way I can see them, I stand on the back porch, and they stand down, and, we, and I, I, I bribe them with haagen bars. But they, I, every single day I contact them. But I can't hug them. I can't embrace them. And I'm luckier than most because they're nearby. There is a reason that Joe Biden right now is winning seniors by more than 20 points and is way up overall. You saw it when he spoke with seniors. And this isn't just conjecture on my part. There are a lot of people doing polling and focus groups with the kinds of normal, non-Breitbart, non-4chan people that Trump needs to win a national election. Uh, and they are just completely done with him. 